Hey everybody, I'm Tarek Merchant and this is Tea Time. I'd like to welcome to the office today, Coach Scott Veith from Drew University Men's and Women's Tennis. Scott, thanks for joining me. Yeah, no problem. Good to be here. Awesome. We're in sunny Florida. He's on a recruiting trip and uh, he thought he'd stop by and this is a perfect time for us to get together, talk a little bit about college sports, college tennis, what it's like to be a student athlete. So. I want to start off by giving Scott a chance to introduce himself, his background, how he got into college tennis. Sure. So uh, you mentioned I'm, I'm Scott Weiff. I'm a men's and women's tennis coach at Drew University in Madison, New Jersey. I've uh, been at Drew for, this is my second year at Drew. I was at another school in New Jersey for 15 years before that. I uh, got into tennis a little bit uh, roundabout, came through other sports. I played football at the collegiate level, tried to play baseball, and my bats found out that I wasn't good enough for it. Um, but I was at a, I was at another school, and uh, we needed a tennis coach on very short notice. Uh, I agreed to help. Uh, athletic director asked me what I knew about tennis. I said, "I'll be you." Um, and he got a little chuckle out of it and said, "Listen, I trust you. Just recruit, organize, discipline, and motivate, and you'll learn tennis." So I spent my first year and a half just asking people why. Why do we practice like this? Why yeah. do other teams do this? Why are we struggling? Uh, and fell in love with tennis. And shortly thereafter, gave up football. So did you play any tennis growing up? No, one one week in phys ed class, that was it. In fact, when I took the job, I didn't own a racket. So okay. the, in that first year, I took you know, I took a look at the, I only had five guys on my team, and when you got five, that's usually not very good. So I found one other kid who wanted to play yeah. uh, and helped all those guys with one thing each. You know, one had a work ethic issue, uh, one had a weight problem, um, one, you know, they, they had their own separate issues. And I spent an hour a week with each of them on their off-court issue. They spent an hour a week on court giving me a private lesson. Okay. Um, so it was like a one one hour for one hour. I'll help you if you can help me. I'm still in touch with all those teams. Awesome. So what school was that at? So I was at Fairleigh Dickinson, uh, the Division three campus. It's uh, at the time it was called College of Florham. They call it Florham Campus now. But also in Madison, New Jersey. So my commute changed by about 0.9 miles when I went over to Drew. Okay. So, That's awesome. Yeah. Um, and growing up, you played baseball and everything, other sports? Everything. Football, baseball, basketball, ice hockey, soccer, wrestling, everything but tennis. In fact, uh, the county that um, Drew and FDU are in is, is Morris County, New Jersey. Still the only high school without tennis is Jefferson. And that's where I went. Okay. So, <laughs> so, so you didn't even have a chance. Didn't have, you know, so maybe if I had a chance, I would have played. But, yeah. so, but, you know, that's, you know, 18 years ago. So, and, you know, a lot of times when I talk to a player, I've been a college head coach longer than they've been alive. So, yeah. you know, it's yeah. not growing up, but you learn a lot. You learn a lot as an adult and you, with, a, with a different set of eyes when you're looking at it from an adult perspective. And when you played baseball, um, where did you play at? So I, uh, I was primarily a first baseman, played a little bit of the outfield. I only played one year of college baseball at Wilkes okay. and uh, I played football at Wilkes as well. And did you play longer as football? Or just... I did. I played, I played football for a total of 14 years. Okay. So from, you know, third grade through college um, and, you know, a little semi-pro tryout here and there. And, camp here and there of, of you know miscellaneous football but yeah. one thing that people don't uh fully understand about football is how much it hurts yeah you know, from, the, <laughs> from your first practice until the day until today yeah uh it hurts what was so, your position i played tight end in college uh okay. and at the high school level i also played on the defensive side of the ball too so, okay nice. fun stuff so. all right so coach um i want to talk to you about a couple things that make a college team special sure. um one is having teammates, right? Yeah, Being yeah. a team sport guy like yeah, yourself. Yeah. Like I played a lot of sports growing up as mm -hmm. well. I absolutely love everything from baseball to ice hockey and soccer mm -hmm. and everything that I did growing up, not football though. Mm -hmm. um, probably wouldn't be alive if I no, played any, is, any, anything is. other than touch football. Right. Um, don't really have the size for that. 140 mm -hmm. pounds uh, doesn't really cut it, right? So, Could be true. So, <laughs> so um, you know, teammates are so important when you get as you've realized now um, in college, college tennis is a team sport. All the other sports that are an individual sports are team oriented. Even golf becomes a team sport sure. in college. So um, what does it mean to have the title of teammate? You always talk about teammates. Yeah, that sure. And, and, and you said it right that, you know, in our program, we see it as a title. And I, I think it's one of the things that separates tennis at the collegiate level from tennis at the USDA or the showcase level or, or, or even at a club. Um, that it is a team sport, that it is for the good of, in our case, Drew University, yeah. um, or you know whatever university you're dealing with. It's, it's, it's for the good of that program, not necessarily the good of yourself. So when we talk about being a teammate at Drew, it is your title. It's not part of what you are. It's capital T, put it on your resume. Your title is teammate. And your job 
as a teammate is to A, support the program in every way you can, and B, make your teammates better. So if I'm talking to a recruit right now, I'm going to let them know that their job is not to come in and win. Their job is to help everybody else win. And everybody else's job is to help, is to help them. So if, if we do that well, if you come into our program and you show up with the purpose of having, helping every other person in our program and they do the same, all of our levels will elevate. So, and when I talk to kids about that title, put it on your resume. Don't just say I was on the team. I want you to put the word teammate in, in capital T, that was my job title. And chances are, when you start your own business or try to work for somebody else, if they if it's a team atmosphere, what they want is a great teammate. And you can have that coming from, from Drew Tennis or, or many different programs. I was a teammate and it was the most important thing I did while I was there. So that's that's kind of how we embrace the, the word teammate as your title. Yeah, I mean, I think that's super interesting because any parent, any player you talk to in the tennis world will kind of frown at that at first, balk at it a little bit because it's what you said is powerful is so you're coming in and your job is not to win, it's to be a good teammate and sure. everything will happen while everybody's just thinking about their own development and they're not thinking about the development of the team and that the fact that even if you win a match or you lose your match, but everyone else wins, you've won. Right. Just like in football, sure. just like in, like I remember when I was playing ice hockey, um, you know, one of my jobs was to shadow a player sure. sometimes. Mm -hmm. And my job was not to score goals sure. at that during that sure. game. My job was not to, you know, pass the puck and make plays. My job was to make sure the other guy, oh, their best the player, couldn't get the puck no. and wouldn't score goals. Sure. And in some way, that wasn't necessarily development on my, you know, goal scoring ability or, or my attacking, um, trying to, it was completely the opposite. Sure. But well, and, and if and I did a good job, we won the game. Well, and, and one of the things that I would say, well, if you look back at that youth coach, yeah, he could have chose anybody on the team for that role. He picked you. Right. You know, that's, that's right. a big deal. He could have chose, yeah. it, so at some point there was a conversation, whether it was him and another coach or him in his own head saying, who do I have that can shut this guy down? I know. That's yeah. the guy. Yeah. We have guys that can score. I have one guy that can shut people down. Yeah. So I was a fast, yeah. fast skater, pestering kid yeah. who played tough, you know, so, small small guy in there, but just not letting that goal score that's huge. touch that's huge the because if, because if they don't score, they can't win, right? Right. So so it's it's what's being asked of you, which is important. If you can embrace what is being asked of you, and like I said, I Drew, you're you're being asked to do one thing: help everybody improve. Yeah. And that goes with you no matter what school sure, you go to, sure. right? Because Absolutely. that's your philosophy. Yeah. How do you adapt to players who say, you know, I've been playing junior tennis all my life and I've been, it's all about, you know, development and winning. And now you're asking me to come to this team and, and to play for the team. And our goal is to win as a team. And sometimes it's going to be at the cost of, yeah, a, a day's development, mm -hmm. for example, or a day's win. Like, just like in ice hockey, I mean, same thing happens in tennis sometimes. You slotted at a certain position or you're asked to do something to slow the player down or to do whatever you need to do to win. So that comes down to my relationship with the player because I'm asking you to help everybody improve. There's not no reward for that. The reward for that is my responsibility. The reward for that is me helping you develop, me finding opportunities for you, me helping you through our assistant coaches, through our network, through our strength conditioning staff, through our whatever we have at our disposal to help you improve. But I'm reluctant to do that with anybody who has not invested in our program. We got a lot of guys, you know. We have a, we're coaching the men and women together. We'll have over 20 right. in our program, which the year, this year, and in a lot of situations, and you talk to coaches every day. Yeah, that's a lot yeah. um, for a men's and women's team combined. Yeah. But I'm responsible to all of them. I am. I will fulfill that responsibility most efficiently and most avidly and most passionately with the ones who I know will do anything for our program. Yeah. So. That's so. That's kind of take take the me out of it. Put put the we in it, and I will help you. Once I know that, I will help you get back to the me. Yeah. Now, what is it you're really looking for? Because I think often when a player arrives at a college campus, they think they know what they're looking for out of a college tennis right. experience, but know. they don't. Yeah, never. They, they, no. almost never. Right. Yeah. But, but, but think I about, didn't know what I was right. And think about how many players in not just tennis but every sport, yeah, their thinking completely changes, and they're happy with their experience. It tells me that they probably didn't know a whole lot going in. Yeah. You know. Or their yeah, and their expectations. Like I know that my expectations were 
like different than what it was and it wasn't good or bad it was just it's just turned different. out to sure. be different yeah sure. and yeah i think that even what you saying like with those when you know contributing to the team and being the mm -hmm. teammate like i was saying even shadowing a player in my hockey game like that was still development of course i learned how to that skill mm -hmm. of of pestering a player making sure he doesn't touch the puck, playing better defense, which I wasn't really good at as, mm -hmm. at all, but I learned how to stay on top of them and play better defense, be aggressive and help my team. And so what I think individual sports, sometimes it, it, it's sometimes like that tunnel vision. Mm -hmm. It's that, you know, it's like, you know that doing these other things can actually right. help you, as sure. you said, come back to your development. Right. And it may not seem that way. Sure, but so so here's here's the yeah. example of how that an example and okay. this ha happened this year. Uh, had a young man on our team who was really struggling to go back on off offense after a good defensive slice. Okay, and a player on our team was like, "I want to help with that." I said, "You know how you can help him? How? You need to develop a good develop good defensive slice. And if you develop that and play against, I won't mention their names, but yeah. if you develop that against him, now guess what you have in your in your toolbox? Yeah, you yeah, have a defensive slice. slice that you didn't have last week." You know, so it may not be individually, you know, it's not a, it's not a uber personal focus, but it is development, yeah. you know. And the other thing that you're developing more so than what you can do with your hands and your feet is your relationship. And yeah. you develop a relationship with a teammate that doesn't go away after four years. Now, I, I, you've probably seen teammates from when you were a kid. And the first thing that comes in is he was on my 12 and under team or whatever. Yeah. But he it's not what class they were. In. If you're an athlete, that's what you think of first. He was a teammate. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So and I, and I, I grew up in football and baseball. Not everybody but, that I hung out with was the greatest person on the planet. A couple people who made some questionable de decisions, but to this day, they're my teammates. Right. You know. So. You stick together. Yeah, most of that's your team. Those, yeah. Yeah. So. Fair enough. Yeah. All right. So let's talk then about the complete student athlete, the experience that a student athlete should get out of college, because I think that is something again that, to your point, where how many people know what they're about to engage in, what sure. they're about to experience, and what should they expect from that from that student athlete experience? I know that when it comes to decision making time, that's often overlooked. Sure, I, I, I definitely think so. Um, so you have that finite window of depending on your level, two years, four years, five years, whatever your institution you're entering into. Yeah. To play as a student athlete. Yeah. You also have that finite window to experience college. You know, now you can keep going after that, but the bills start racking up after that, right? So. I mean, being completely involved in your campus, to me, is a big deal. If your campus is doing campus cleanups or if they're doing study abroads or they're doing Wall Street semesters or internships and you're not, you're missing out on what your school has to offer. So my players will come to me all the time and say, am I allowed to this or that? And my answer is usually, well, I'm not, I'm not charged that. This is your experience. Yes, are you permitted to? Absolutely, I will never tell you no. Is there a chance it gets within the way of 10 there is. There's a chance. Um, but I don't believe that Drew Tennis is all that Drew has to offer. It's a good chunk. It's pretty good. I enjoy right. it. But we offer a whole lot more than that. And right. we're not the only school that works that way. That's right. Every school so, you works know, that way. Yeah. You know? yeah. So that's important to get yeah. the whole experience, to take advantage of the internships, to be in a club, even if you don't want to be, just to see that dynamic. Yeah. Um, I think I, I don't get along with the players. Rarely do I get along with the players who play tennis, go to class, go to sleep. Come back to tennis. I don't. I we don't usually hit it off all that well. Why? Um, I think they're very narrow-minded. They're they're very narrow-minded in their approach to what college should be. Okay. I think you have to have some fun in college. Sure. <laughs> I mean, if you're not, you're missing out. I think I people mean, are misguided by you know they're, they everyone's thinking of hey if I go to you know the top teams in the nation mm -hmm. and it's just you know it's so focus driven and I've heard they all say I've heard that I can't do certain degrees because their focus is here on the tennis. Now, there probably is a handful, or we, there is a handful of schools around the country, um, the top of the, the cream of the crop, mm -hmm. that yeah, if you're going in there, then the, the tennis and your you know small social life, but there still is sure. a social right, life, right, right. Um, and then the academics all come together. Sure. But those players also are the ones that are like close to potentially having a chance at some sure. sort of a tour. Right. They, but, they've already made a sacrifice in their life that probably omitted some sort of social yeah, additional, additional yeah, stuff sure, yeah, because, yeah. and they're going somewhere like you know i was talking the other day with somebody about yeah basketball for mm -hmm. example like if you're playing at kentucky and duke and all mm -hmm. these places 
there are players on the team, yes, one or two or whatever, going to get drafted by the NBA. Mm -hmm. Then there's a couple players that will go play in Europe or Australia or China or whatever. They all have, soccer does the same thing and, and others like baseball does that a lot. You know, you will have the opportunity to make a career out of it at some degree. So, you know, you'll make 40, 50, 60 grand or more a year doing that. And it's a job for people for the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. Those 1% is, is different sure. and they've made that, but they don't realize that majority of people are that 99%. And those 99% are doing what you're saying, mm -hmm. which is you're getting the student athlete experience, which includes your sport, which includes your um, academics and includes a fulfill, fulfilling social experience sure. that includes clubs and teams and uh, experiences, right? Yep. And we need to get off the focus of that 1%, sure. like right. you said, who yeah. have done that. Right, and it's not, you know, Two things. A quick, quick story about that yeah. is I had a kid that I used to coach when I was at FDU. A kid named Max. Loved this kid. Great relationship. But as okay. a freshman, uh, we had a weekend in the fall where I locked his rackets in my office. Okay. And he's like, oh, why did you do that? I'm like, because you need something else, dude. You need to do something else while you're here. Four years later, he graduated with a wonderful experience. He got into Greek life. He got into student government. But as a fall, you know, first semester freshman, he was so intent on playing tennis that if he did that at that rate for four years, he would burn out. There's no doubt in my mind he would burn out. And we'd have very few friends. You were graduated college with a very narrow experience. Yeah. You know, so, you know, and then the other side of that, and not really the other side, but another point on that same argument is in our sport, in tennis, you know, what percentage, you know, the total number of American men making $100,000 a year playing tennis this year, 12, 13 guys, maybe. Maybe. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. maybe, yeah. And, and that's, and that's, you know, obviously there's sponsorship money and that kind of stuff, but maybe there's a dozen guys. Yeah. There's a real good chance that they're not going through. Real good chance. Yeah. You yeah. Know? yeah. Um, yeah. There's like, a real good, good chance they're not even going to any of this. Or any college. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. And how many of those guys played college tennis? Two or three? Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. maybe. So yeah. it may be, it's a different approach if you're playing baseball. Maybe it's different with basketball or football. Yeah. But a worthwhile goal to be a professional in tennis is to run your own club. Or to you know to be a college coach. That in my mind is the professional tennis yeah, that's yes. worthwhile, worth pursuing, and you can do that with a social life. You, know, you right. absolutely can. In fact, if you don't have a social life, you're probably not going to be much of a coach. Right. You know. Right. No, I can't agree with you more. I mean, some of the experiences that I've had as well, like it got me a job with the Orlando Magic sure. because I networked and I met the right people. I had friends on the basketball team, baseball team. Sure. You know, cool. um, different places, going to different events. I remember, like, even, you know, I never used to go to the international stuff. Um, being from Canada, right, it's like, you know, very, yeah, it's very similar. I mean, you speak the same language and sure. all that. So I, I mesh well with the American right. and boys and girls. Yeah, culturally, it, it could be similar. Um, but then I had a bunch of guys on the team and girls, you know, on the women's tennis team that would do that. And they would take, bring, invite me out. And so I joined the international club. And that was a lot of fun because I, I learned stuff too like sure. that I didn't know. And then when I went to Europe in 06 for the World Cup with a bunch of my buddies, I mean, I went and stayed with a bunch Terrific, of them. Right. And they showed me a great time. And um, like you said, it wasn't that narrow experience. It right. broadened my horizons. I still work with some of them. They're sure. like my agents over there. That's and great. they help me out and I help them out. Yeah, you know, and, and think about it too. Like when you, know, when you played in college, yeah. you know, people will talk about that focus. You can get plenty accomplished in a good two-hour practice. Plenty, you know, you can probably get a, most of the hitting you want to get done. You can work on doubles. You can work on game development. Yeah. You can go there for a half hour in the weight room, you know, and maybe, and, and, then, and then if your meals are pretty good, that's three hours of your day dedicated to improvement in that sport. And you probably accomplished a lot in those three hours if you showed up with a purpose to work. 100%. 21 other hours in the day, yeah. you know? So yeah. what does that really even mean to be focused yeah. I would be way more productive. I remember at school, especially when I was in Jacksonville, where it was like super hot. Mm -hmm. Two hours on the court, hard practice, sure. working on some stuff. Work. One hour with like you know a little bit of rest in between in the weight room mm -hmm. and conditioning. That's a full mm -hmm. day. Like that was improvement, yep. like crazy. Rather than sometimes we'd spend four hours on the court, and you know you're kind of just shooting the shit for a little while. Yep. Yep. You're not really yep. like giving it, and then you're just wasting time. Mm -hmm. And you know at the end of the day, like. That's what the other kids are doing too. Plus, they have other commitments. So, mm -hmm. 
you're not really getting ahead. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things I used to before I got into coaching full time, well, I guess it's still coaching, but yeah. I was a fitness director at a YMCA, and we shifted most of our personal training sessions from one hour sessions to forty five minute sessions. Mm -hmm. We didn't change the charge, but we went to forty five minutes. And basically, what we told people is, be warmed up when I show up. Yeah, we'll teach you the cool down, but we have forty five minutes of actual work, and we're gonna work. Yeah, and the results went in the right direction they, where we wanted them. We were also able to fit in more appointments in the and make a little bit more money as a company that way. Yeah. But okay, your warm up is yours, your cool down is yours. We have 45 minutes to accomplish things, not, not shoot sprints. Let's accomplish things yeah. for 45 minutes. And the people who wanted to work worked. And it was 45 minutes more than enough. Yeah. And it's interesting because sometimes when you do the warm up and stuff, you get everyone gets too involved in the chit chat. Sure, and then next thing you know, 20 minutes go by, and that 45 yeah. minutes isn't even the 45 right. minutes. Right. So that's right. a good well, then, then you find out with somebody for the private lesson or a personal training yeah. session is paying for. Sometimes yeah. they're just paying for your ear. That's, that's right. The case, well, then we can listen. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> okay. So ne um, next thing, uh, what do, what is a what should a player expect from a coach? Honesty. You know, honesty is a big deal. I think a lot of players struggle with it, um, but very rarely have I come across a coach who is malicious. They they may be honest. And more honest than what you want to hear. Yeah. But the vast majority of co coaches just don't want anybody wasting their time. So they'll tell you, right now, your backhand is not good enough for a varsity lineup. That's not an attack. It's truth. You know, there are ways to fix that. You yeah. know, so honesty is a big deal. You should expect honesty from your coach. Okay. You know, um, fairness. Fairness is a big deal because they that whole thing where the idea where everybody gets treated equally I, is belong. You know when you'll get treated equal? When you're equal, you know? And I have players that I can say, I can say something to some of my players that's pretty harsh and he'll look me in the eye and he'll say, yes, sir. And some of the other players, they'll go, that'll be on social media about how mean a person I am or whatever. So treating people the same is not really the goal, I don't think. But treating them fairly absolutely is the goal. Give them your time. Put expectations on them. You know, reward them for achieving those expectations. You know, make sure they're aware when they do not achieve those expectations. Yeah. Um, and off the court help. Managing your day is something so many coaches overlook. I hear so many people that say, I, this coach is great to hit with. Good. That's a good skill to have. Yeah. yeah. There's a whole lot more to running a college program than being able to hit from the baseline. Yeah. Management. People forget that, that coaches are managers, sure. right? Sure. And it's not just managing right. the tennis practice. Yeah, sure. It's been your... Yeah, you're, you're, you're dealing with... You know, it's when I when I left football, yeah. I, I, one of the reasons, and it's the, I told this story the other day, it was a Wednesday night in June. It was 11 p.m. and we were putting in another recruiting video of a kid who I was confident would never help any college football team. Okay. And I said right then and there, I'd rather deal with people. I don't want to watch recruiting videos. I want to deal with human beings because this sport's simple. It's fuzzy ball and white lines has got to bounce over there twice. You know, the yeah. rest is interpersonal development. Yeah. So how is it? How do we make you better? I think that is an absolute expectation you should have of your coach, on the court and off. When I leave here, how am I going to be a better guy? How am I going to be a better young lady? You know? Yeah. Well, we miss that part again too because, you know, at that age, the focus also is: Can I be a pro? Can I be the best player? Can I be number one in the country? Can I be the best college player? Um, they forget about that student athlete experience sure. and what to expect from the college yeah. coach. You know, it's always, it's often focused on what I think is the wrong things because like I tell my staff this all the time. I tell kids, coaches, like, um, like once a player, as you know, because you've been coaching, is once a player gets into your program and at some point between before sophomore year and or, or beginning of junior year, they realize that this is about the student athlete experience, sure. that they're gonna go get a job one day, mm -hmm. in or out of sports, that they're gonna wanna have a great time, that they're gonna wanna make good friends and be a great teammate, and um, that it's all about the experience and the social and everything. Yeah. And so you see some kids, as you mentioned, like go all tennis in or all sports in, and then you gotta pull the rackets off and lock them up for a bit and say, go enjoy, and then, or they do that for the first year or two and then realize that, no, no I need to do more. Yeah, sure. You know, I had a guy on my team that was kind of like that mm -hmm. too. And then realized after starting junior year, like, Hey, right. you know, it's more than just hitting a couple balls and where am I going to go with this? Right. So it's, 
And then that requ- that that directly goes with the expectation of the coach, right? It's sure. like, okay, so do I need a guy who's going to be able to train me to be, you know, the next pro? And, and no one's stopping anybody from no, being no, a pro, no, right? Of course not, no. But the reality for most of these athletes, whether you're a tennis player, a basketball player, mm-hmm. football, baseball, is that you're not. Right. You know, there's that small handful of people, and they're already at those top colleges. So when you're getting into mm-hmm. a school like Drew, yeah. you know, you're coming for the experience. Sure. So then, yes, I'm looking for that coach mm-hmm. to be a great person, yeah. to teach my kid skills sure. that they can use for the rest of their well, life. Well, and that they, when they get out of school, that they feel the way I did and the way you did. Yeah, hey, sure. I had the best time of my life. Great time. Yeah. I played my sport and did the best I could. I had a coach that was behind me that helped me with my weaknesses and my strengths and you mm-hmm. know congratulated me when I did something good, told me when I did something bad. And at the end of the day, like everything about that experience was unbelievable. Sure. And and, and it's that's I think that's very much how we'll go about things at Drew. And so one one of the things that I tell our players all the time is more isn't better, more is just more, you know. We can do things better, but yeah. that requires a plan. That requires a, a half hour meeting of actual note taking and assignments and sticking to it. But more forehands isn't the problem. More serves isn't the problem. Maybe we need to coach a little bit of be- better. Maybe we need to sit it down with some video and make sure we know what we're doing. But, you know, just spending more time on things is not the always, always yeah. the answer. And if I spend more time with everybody, there's already not enough time. So more with everybody, Means we, nobody sleeps, right? You know, yeah, yeah. so let, let's let's yeah. just get better. Let's be let's be better at this. Let's let's make sure we're getting quality out of it. So that's you know you know we, when we talk about that that great experience that they have, um, and and you know even going back to what we said about being a teammate, um, one of the best things a coach can do for a player is the recommendation letter when they leave. You know, and I have two that I show my players at the beginning of every season. One of them is a typed letter yep. that says. This young man was a member of our team from this date to that date. Call me with any questions. That one. Okay. And the other one is four pages handwritten in pen about front and back of all the wonderful things that this young lady did and how I believe she would be great for your organization. So which one do you want? Which which of these letters do you want? Do you want the one that says that confirms the dates? Or do you want the one that I wrote for four hours one night because you were worth that time in my life? To, to handwrite and think about all these things that happened. I think that's one of the greatest things a coach can do for somebody is really give them the, the, the recommendation that they earned. You know, they were so good to my program that I will, and if you apply for another job, I'll, I'll write a different one to somebody else handwritten. But this guy over here, he's getting the same one. Yep, he was on the team, here you go. Yeah. You know, who do you want yeah. to be, you know? So, but that, that's, that ties into what was your experience? How did you invest in our program? Did you help us improve? You know. How often are you monitoring this, um, you know, like you said, uh, helping them grow? How often are you monitoring that and having meetings with them? I mean, that's the expectation not from enough. the coach, right? Not enough. Honestly, not yeah. enough. Um, I found maybe it's just the easiest way on my part, yeah. um, but the door's open. You know? right. Right. I have to remind myself that a player won't always walk through that door. So the players who haven't came and come and see me in a week, we need a meeting, even if it's five minutes. Just yeah. how's it going? Um, but the doors, and I have probably four or five players who will come to my office every single day. Yeah. Sometimes, well, I, think it's sometimes I gotta shoot yeah. them off. Yeah. <laughs> like, all right, I, I do work here too, you know, yes. but, um, but, yeah, so. But you'd rather that than, than nothing, right? Absolutely. Because, um, yeah, I think it's on, it's on the players too, right? I mean, you, like you said, I can't, you give I can't leave platform. it on the players. I can't, like, no. I don't want to leave it on the players because no. some of them won't. So sometimes we need to schedule stuff. Um, and some people need to be spoken to every day. Um, you know, some people, I, well, I mean, you, you worked with Vanit, who, yeah. Vanit Van, Van Lopley, who came through your program before he came to Drew. Um, Vanit didn't come in the office very open, very often, but in the first two minutes of every practice, we had a quick talk. Yeah. Perfect. He felt good about it. I felt good about it. We probably both smiled about it. And then I knew he was going to go out there and win most yeah. of the time, you know, yeah. um, and his teammates loved him and respected him. There that's, that, that's that manager side, right? Right. Like, sure. So you're yeah. managing each individual. Sure. And then you're being honest and fair with each of them yeah. and motivating them to be better. Right? Yeah. So, you know, I, I believe you should spend, you know, the vast majority of your time with, you know, your, your, the middle of your roster, the guys who are the guys and ladies who are 
you know, outside of the top 15% and yeah. above the bottom 15%. Spend your time because they will make the most difference. That, that, that player who is the absolute best player and they're good. Every time you need to go see them, all they need is a fist bump and a refill on their water. Yeah. Good. They're good. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're good. You should still need to make time to say how much you appreciate them. Yeah. But yeah, they don't need to get called in for the meeting all that often, especially when the GPA and the 4L and they already have their, you know, yeah, they have their stuff, stuff set together. up, you know, so. How much has athletics factor into a decision uh, making process? So, I, so I, I think if, if you can help a recruit envision their ideal day, okay? So their ideal day includes, let's say you're awake for 14 hours yep. ish, whatever. Sure. Um, if three hours of that is on the tennis court or including tennis, then it should be about three fourteenths of your decision. You know, if if five hours of that is in the classroom, then that classroom stuff should be about five fourteenths of your decision. You know, if you map out your perfect day yeah. of how I want to spend my day on a regular basis, whatever percentage tennis or basketball or lacrosse is, then that's the percentage it should factor in. You know, I do think so. We have we have two transfers on our roster. One's an Ivy League transfer, and one's a Patriot League transfer. Uh, and uh, I think they saw the name of the school and it factored in way more than what they actually wanted to do with their time. The schools they went to are wonderful yeah. for other people. Yeah. But they were not a good fit for those two young men. So I don't think they took an accurate look at how they want to spend their day and say, how does that fit into my life at this school? So if you really are going to spend nine hours a day playing tennis, first of all, I'm probably not the right group for it. If, you're, if you plan on spending nine hours a day, six days a week, 365 days a year, I have other coaches I'll give a shot to. Right, right. Um, but if you're going to work for about two, three hours a day, yeah. and, and, and then it can work here, it should be three fourteenths or three fifteenths of your decision. Right. You know? right. So that's that goes back, and, and I think that goes back to the reality of stuff is that some people are expecting to play a lot more tennis um, and the reality in college tennis is that you'll play a little bit more most likely at the highest level programs but then you have to be that level player right and sure. if you're not that level player then you're going to a place where it's not going to be as big of a focus or even if it is as big of a focus it might be at less hours because the academics is important too or it's rigorous and it requires your time and um, you just have to also be comfortable with what it is, right? right? Well, you and, know, and, I'm, and then to your point, it's like if you don't want that, then you shouldn't be a student athlete, right? right. So, and I, and I, so recently, I would say yeah. probably about two weeks ago, I, I was I was looking on some of the stuff that you put out there about loving your sport, sport versus liking your sport. Yeah. Um, I talked about it at the, <laughs> at the exposure, right? And, 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 and it's, yeah. it's 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 a it's a very valid point. You know, being married to tennis and being. And I, a guy who likes to play tennis, they're different, you know. Yeah. There, there's, there is a college out there for you if you like to play. Yeah. You know. And you know the other thing that I tell my players too is, if we're done with practice, the courts aren't closed now. Yeah. <laughs> they're still, they're, still, they're still there. Yeah. Yeah. You know. And some people like that blend. Some people want that hour of getting yelled at, yeah. and an hour to just hit with my buddy. Yeah. You know. We can provide that. You know. Some schools won't. You know, maybe courts are 15 minutes from campus, or maybe right. they're shared with a private academy, or whatever. Um, but there are plenty of schools too where that, those courts are also wreck, and you can go out there anytime if that's what you're looking for. Yeah. You know, our school does that. Some others do as well, um, and there are somewhere that's not the case. But if that's if that's the kind of player you are, like a person who wants to work hard for a while, and when I also want to, I'd like to go out there and hit with my buddy. You know, yeah, I thing, did that. Sure. When I was in New Mexico, Western New Mexico. Like I would practice with the team, and then Saturdays uh, there was this guy Bobby. He was used to play college tennis. Great, mm -hmm. great player, and um, was a high school team coach. He'd come out on Saturdays mornings with me, and we'd hit for two or three great. hours. Sometimes after practice, I'd be out there um, for an hour hitting some serves. Sometimes my coach would see me and walk over and help me out a little bit. Sometimes just let me do my own thing. And uh, there were other guys on the team that would do that too. And like you said, that. The environment, if that's what you want and offers it, then then you go do your thing, right? And if it doesn't, like uh, if there's a club and whatnot, then you just have to know that's part of your yeah. maybe decision making factor. Yeah. Maybe that you deal with it. Sure. So I, I remember a kid that I used to work. I like with. that envision your day, by the way. Yeah. Really good. Like well, still, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the <laughs> really uh, like um, 
there was a kid that when I was at FDU, I was I, part of my responsibility was strength conditioning. Yeah. And there was a kid who would just kind of hang out in the weight room after his team was done. And I just said, hey, hey what are you still doing? He goes, leg hair. That was it. That was the whole thing. He did his work. He worked his butt off in the weight room. But he also saw it as his social opportunity. Yeah, that's, that's cool. He wasn't disruptive. He didn't do anything wrong. He just liked to just hang. Yeah. And that, and for him, that was a good fit. That yeah. school was a real good fit for him. Yeah. So. Well, I want to ask you about strength and conditioning right. because, okay. um, like, I, I this resonates with me. And uh, this summer at the collegiate exposure camps when we've been doing our tour, I've been trying to emphasize the warm up and the cool down as much as possible. We've had a hot summer. Mm-hmm. We were just at Wesleyan last week. Um, that you, you weren't at that one, right. but um, it was super hot and like humid. Yeah, kids were dropping like flies, mm-hmm. and every day I was like hydrate sure. and replenish and spend time and get rest and stretch out. And so we do things as a group. But for me, I, I was the opposite of that kid. When growing up, I was an immature student athlete because. I was indestructible at that time. I was the kid that never got injured really? or never had a serious injury. I could run like crazy all day long. Didn't have a problem with weight or anything, like mm-hmm. super fit. And But I had terrible flexibility. And I remember even one day at practice, we used to have this strength coach who used to come in who was an ex-Olympian. Mm-hmm. And his daughter was really good. She actually went to Harvard as well. And um, he would, I remember he was doing the stretch like mm-hmm. up over my shoulder, and that's mm-hmm. as far as my left arm would go almost. And he was like, Oh man, that's a problem. Sure. But you don't really take it much because everything's working at that time. Sure. Fast forward, sophomore year of school, mm-hmm. I start getting the serious problems, and I still don't do anything about it. So, strength and conditioning, especially when you get to the collegiate level where the kids are faster, stronger, sometimes mm-hmm. three, four years older than you, how important is that? So, I, th- I think the most important thing in strength conditioning at any age is healthy movement patterns. I don't, I don't care if you're 12 or 82, you know, you moving efficiently and effectively and and controlling your body. Well, that is what strength conditioning is about. Um, you know, obviously I came up through football, baseball, ice hockey, basketball, where people wanted to know how much you bench press. Nobody cares. Really, nobody cares. Nobody cares, guys. Nobody cares what you bench press. Right. Maybe at the gym they do, but in real life, nobody cares. Um, but what you, you know, having a lack of balance or having a lack of flexibility or having some sort of injury risk, um, that can change everything. You know, you know, you, you hear about people that slip and fall as older adults. A general loss of balance does the same thing for an athlete or could do the same thing for an athlete. Yeah. So there are a couple different functional movement screens out there. You know, Gary Gray's got one. There's stuff that, uh, you know, a bunch of different training facilities do. But usually a really qualified strength coach can show you where your risk of injury is before it happens. Like you just said about your strength. He told you yeah. that the issue was, you know, in your in your left arm as it led into the back. And he was right, yeah. you know. Um, 100% right. <laughs> so, but that's... <laughs> It's, it's a map, you know, a good functional movement screen is a map to where the injury is going to happen. I was just at a, a showcase yesterday with a kid that I know for certain will have ankle in, in injury in college. How severe it will be, I don't know, but he will have an ankle injury, right. you know. Um, the movement patterns are just that flawed. In most cases, they're fixable. So I think the most important thing when it comes to strength conditioning mm-hmm. is injury prevention, core strength, balance. Yeah. Um, how much weight you can move, is re- especially in our sport, is really not important. No. Um, now, I will also say this. At the Division three level, if you love a certain type of workout, then incorporate it. If you love CrossFit, then incorporate it. If yeah. you love overhead press, then incorporate it. If you love a mile run, then incorporate it. People em- <laughs> emphasize too much on what they should do and like specific exercises and, like you said, specific That's types, right. whether it's CrossFit yeah, or it's... Sure. Or it's plyometrics. Well, they're all good and they're all bad, right? They're all, yeah. they're all good and they're all bad. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so. kind of everything in moderation. So, yeah. but, it, but injury, and if you think of it, about it from a coach's perspective, and, and in our sport, there usually are not a ton of substitutes. Right. A, a deep team might have three extra guys. You know, I'm, I have a luxury of having more than that. Right. Um, but that's a choice. I, I chose to carry that many guys. Um, and then I have guys that I won't get rid of because I like them and they're pretty good. Yeah. You know, so but a lot of them don't. So from a coach's perspective, your best ability is probably availability. 
You know, yeah. if, if you're if you're available for this match, that is what I'm looking for. So the injury prevention part is big, um, and you know, one of the things that I one of the things that killed me is people would say, you know, I want I just want to be able I just want to have abs. Well, if you can stand erect, you have abs. There's just things in the way that stop people from seeing them. You know, but that's just that, like if you look at the skeletal chart and the muscular chart, they're there. Yeah. You know. Yeah. What they look like, how dense they are, that that might might not be what you're looking for. Right. But we're there, I promise. You know, so injury prevention is huge. Functional movement is, you know, training on your feet. You know, when I I'll, I tell tennis players all the time, you know, because I walk in the door and they see somebody that probably used to bench press a lot, and it's true. But but if you're laying on your back, tennis, you lost already. So, so what's the difference what you do when once you're in there? Yeah, you know we needed to be effective on our feet yeah. and changing direction. So, and changing direction with an efficient, effective movement pattern that is going to be helpful. So, that's the important stuff. Awesome. So, um, let me end it off with this. Okay. I got a baseball. Oh boy. Or Ju baseball hey, watch man. from me. So, yeah. I got a baseball actually that I caught at a Ju game Love back it. in the day. Love it. Um, show us how to throw a curveball. Oh, I'll throw a curveball. Okay, so okay. or whatever you want. How I would how I would throw a curve is, and, and by the way, I was not a great pitcher. I know how to do it um, because I saw a lot of them. Because when people want to get me out, they just had to throw a curveball. So, but if I if I'm coming over top, I'll put my fingers there so I get a little snap on the ball. Come over top, finish with my thumb pointing at the target, finish down low. I like you're not gonna see a lot of lefty knuckleballers, and I'm a whole lot better with a wiffle ball than I am with a baseball. But but that's basically it. We just come over top, and that ball hopefully will dance. Um, if it doesn't, you get a chance to have somebody go get it when it's way back yeah, over there. That's but, what I like. Yeah. <laughs> so, but this is, you know, I know I'm the tennis guy holding the baseball, but. You know, well, actually, baseball guy yeah. Yeah. turned tennis. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. So, I, I spent a whole lot more time in football, not as much as I, I wish I spent more time playing this sport. Um, but, you know, when, when, yeah. when, when the coach, when the coach looks at you and says, keep your helmet on, you keep your helmet on. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> so I, and I, I remember talking to hockey coaches when I was, you know, we both grew up, Target and I both grew up with hockey. And uh, yeah. you know, I have three brothers that played in college or tried to play in college. And uh, I remember clear as day the youth uh, hockey coach told me to take my skates off and put my cleats back on. So, and I was okay. That's fine. I got you. Coach. My coach was like, could you grow a little bit more? <laughs> could you get a little bit bigger? Because then we could really use sure. you after yeah. you turn yeah. 50. Yeah, I don't, I don't get to pick it out. Yeah, I had, so. to, I had to hang up the skates for other reasons. <laughs> and then tennis was a good one. But, uh, Coach, thank you very great much. I appreciate that. Enjoyed, yeah. It was sure. a lot of fun. Yeah. And um, a lot of great knowledge, a lot of great information. And uh, I think it's great getting an outside perspective from somebody who didn't grow up in the tennis world sure. and now is in the tennis world coaching collegiate tennis at the highest level and uh, bringing all of your insight and value from the teammate perspective. I think we could use way more of that. And um, everybody, I think, would be much better tennis players and better teammates and better athletes if we were integrating that and transitioning into that way better which is a tough thing to do and i think you're doing a great job with Trying. your team and um what you do with the kids i think that's unbelievable at the end of the day to have a great experience which Absolutely. you're offering them it's Absolutely. uh it's what it's all about yes sir all right thanks a lot